The Surviving Generations of the Holocaust, based in Seattle, Washington, has taken on the project of videotaping eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust from those individuals who survived the Nazi reign of terror. Millions of people were annihilated just because they were Jewish. The goals of this project are, first, to educate the current and future generations about the Holocaust with the hope that those who learn what happened will not allow it to happen again, never again to any group of people. Second, to refute false allegations by neo-Nazis and revisionist historians that the Holocaust never occurred. And third, to refute the commonly held notion that the Jewish people offered little, if any, resistance to the Nazis. The voices of the dead are silent. The voices of the survivors must live on forever. My name is Michael Spector. Today I am interviewing Mr. Sam Farkas, Holocaust survivor who lives in Seattle, Washington. Sam, can you tell me a little bit about where you were born and a little bit about your family and the family background. I was born in a town which was called Tereswa and I had three older brothers and two younger sisters. We were six children. Uh, what do you mean by tell you more? Their okay. names? Okay, my oldest brother, his name was Hershey, second oldest was Shia, and then Sunny, who is a survivor who lives in Denver, and my name is Sam. It was Samuel, actually, but in, in this country, it's Sam. I had two younger sisters. Uh, the, one of them was Hannah Gietl, and the younger one was Mirala, Miro. And that was my family. And your and mother's my, name? My mother's name was Esther, and my father's name was Abraham Chaim. And your mother's maiden name? Langsner. Okay, and you were born when? I was born July the 14th, 1928. Okay. Could you tell me a little bit about Teresva and how the community was prior to 1939? Teresva was a small town. It had, uh, it had about 2,200 people. 200 out of those people were Jewish people. Uh, it had three synagogues. The the people were, the majority of the people were not Czechs, they were Ukrainians, even so it was under the government of Czechoslovakia, and it was called the Kar Karpat Oya, it was the Karpatan part of, uh, of the country. And, but you, had a, you also could go to the Czech school, and you could go to Ukraine school. The majority from the Gentile kids, they went to the Ukraine school because they talked Ukraine between them. And, uh, and up till 1939, it was ruled by Masur, by the Czechs, by the Czech government. In 1939, the Hungarians invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, after the, which of course, the Hungarians sided with the Germans, they invaded them. So in other words, the Germans had control over the invasion of the Hungarians. And the Hungarians followed the rules what the Germans imposed on them, how to treat the Jews. And, and as soon as the Hungarians invaded Czechoslovakia, right away the discrimination against the Jews started. By, uh, in the school as kids, by, being, uh, by not being treated equal with the Gentile kids, by uh, not uh, the teachers, not uh, devoting too much effort to explain things to a Jewish kid, uh, by calling Jewish kids by names, uh, by, by telling the Jewish kids uh, that uh, Hitler will get you. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, it was said, uh, Hitler na tebe prišli, pride. That means Hitler will get to you. Uh, we as Jews, in that time, we didn't know as much about Hitler yet, how strong his popularity was in the power. But for some reason, the Gentile kids knew more about it, and they already started to scare us that we are not going to last too long because Hitler would get to us. And of course, uh, uh, and after that, uh, they also abused us physically, that we, 
uh, by walking out of school. They attacked us, they beat us, by, and then they gave us different curfews that we were not allowed to walk the streets. Uh, from late in the afternoon on, they uh, broke windows from the synagogues. The Jews had, were scared to gather for prayers in the synagogues. So a lot of them, prayer, uh, the prayers were performed in private houses. And from 1939 on, actually, it started, and it got worse all the time. Can you tell me a little bit about um, your father and what he did, and some personal instances where things happened specifically to you? My father was a very popular and a very famous man. He, uh, he dealt in timber. And timber, what I mean by that is he used to not buy the land, only the timber from the land. And he used to buy thousands and thousands of acres of land, uh, uh, towns. And, uh, and every project used to last anywhere between five and 10 years. And my father had about, uh, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I would say around 2,000 people working for us. All the little towns around in that particular area, the majority worked for my father. My father also uh, exported different kind of timbers. In other words, there was woods which you can make furniture or so building materials. And all these, and we had our own sawmill, and we exported to Hungary and exported to Romania, and also provided Czechoslovakia. So my father was a very famous man. He was also uh, very much involved in the government of the country. He supported it. Uh, he uh, helped to elect uh, Masaryk's son as president. He was very influential. Uh, when, our, when our personality came to our town for different causes, raising money, say a rabbi came, he stayed in our villa. We had uh, uh, a house, a very huge house, like a villa. And the reason why my father had them stay in our house, in our villa, is because he knew that by staying in our villa, that particular personality would be able to accomplish the cause because everybody would donate to the cause because the fact is he stays at our place and he works for us. And he did not make any exceptions if a, if a priest came to town for some reason. He also provided him with lodging. But as far as uh, being a Jew to religion, he was strictly a very orthodox Jew. And we all were raised uh, orthodox. We had uh, kosher and our uh, uh, meals, and we went to Jewish school. And we were brought up uh, as Jews. But uh, my father was very sympathetic to the human race as a whole. And this is why my father never believed that anybody would want to harm us. Out of the people who worked for us, they offered to hide us out. My father didn't, want to ex didn't even want to talk about it because my father always said, why would they want to hurt us when we contribute so much to the economy? And he was just a great believer in the, in the human race. And, and of course, uh, they did hurt us. Do you remember some instances specifically that happened to you prior to, to 39 and then a little bit after 39? Well, prior to 39, I was a very happy kid. Uh, we were uh, had a lot of friends, you know, all the age group in my town. And uh, we were very happy kids. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a lot of love from the family. The most important thing to my father and mother was us. And they, they provided us with private schooling. Uh, they, they hired uh, Jewish teachers just for us. But there was also a lot of poor kids, Jewish kids in town, which they couldn't afford a Jewish education. So my father paid the teacher and took in other kids. And uh, 
And what else can what else can I tell you about my child? Well, as I say, I was a very happy child. What happened in '39 then specifically to you, as far as well in '39, in '39, uh, the Gentile friends what I had prior to that, uh, they seemed to change. They were influenced by the propaganda what Hitler started making, and they were in a way. Uh, They wanted, they started uh, not looking at us like they used to. Uh, their friendship cooled off. They started to blame us because we were Jews. And they started to, uh, we used to stand up as friends, even they were Gentiles, we were Jews, we used to stand up in case a Gentile friend of mine got into trouble or somebody was trying. We used to, but they never noticed the difference that they never stood up for us. And, uh, and also they used to abuse us in a way. The, the older kids, they used to abuse me physically. And I was afraid to go to school and I used to have to buy them off not to abuse me uh, because I was, uh, they were bigger than I was and they felt that uh, that they want to get something out of me, so by by giving them chocolate, so they they, they always promised me that they were not going to abuse me. But after they accepted it, and after uh, and after they you stop the chocolates or the few pennies, you know, yeah. then the rest of the kids uh, uh, started to call us names and. Uh, and insulting us, and if that particular kid or two didn't say anything, and he says, hey, how come you keep your mouth shut? Do you, are you a Jewish friend? And of course, uh, to, to be accepted again by his friends, that Gentile kid, uh, forgot all about the chocolates, what I gave him, and started abusing again. For example, we had uh, the kids, the Jewish kids did not get the education anymore what the Gentile kids did. But they, they still wanted to torture more as the Jewish kids. So the, the, we had a, once a week we had boxing after school. Okay, the boxing part, they did not fit your opponent with your weight, like your featherweight. They fit your opponent with your grade. And the Jewish kid always had the biggest guy who flunked probably prior to that, who weighed 30, 40 pounds more as his opponent. And you could not get rid of the opponent unless you defeated him. And of course, I always used to, every week, I used to come home with black eyes, and my poor mother already knew, so she was waiting with ice. And, uh, and no matter how many times I used to try to get rid of this opponent by buying him off to let me to let me beat him so I can get rid of him. And he always promised me, and once I hit him a round or two, the rest of the kids and the rest of the school started to yell, beat that Jew, kill that Jew, and of course, again, he used to beat the hell out of me. <laughs> and that, of course, ha that went on until actually I was taken away to the, concentrate, to the ghetto. And other things would happen to the Jewish kids because you were always scared to get out. Uh, uh, from your backyard, because if you got out of the street, you wanted to walk to a store for a soda pop, you were always scared that you will get beat up. And, uh, and even so, the fathers for those kids used to work for my father, but the kids, they still couldn't control the kids because they were more influenced by the propaganda for Hitler than, the, than, their, than their fathers were. And, and, the f and the kids, of course, when my father went to their fathers complaining about their kids beating up on us, they denied it. And they couldn't control, in a way, their own children. Okay. Now, in 1939, the Hungarians came. What happened then? Well, like I say, when the Hungarians came, right away things changed. You could, you could feel the difference in the friendship what you had from other kids and and even from the elderly citizens. 
because prior to that, uh, us as kids, we used to walk the streets. Elderly people, grown-ups, adults, we, when they used to walk through us, they used to greet us because they knew who we were. After that, uh, no, they used to turn their heads like they would neglect us completely. And uh, Now, your father met with the Hungarian government, did he not? My father met with the Hungarian government, and the Hungarian government always promised him that nothing will happen to him, and they, and they appreciate what he does. But in the same time, they always used to threaten him. The higher officials used to threaten him a lot, and they used to interrogate him all the time. They used to come to our house, interrogate him in isolation for hours, and uh, because they knew if they will scare my father, he would give him money. And pretty soon somebody else found out, and so pretty soon a lot of them did it because they knew. And of course, my father always complied by giving money because he was afraid, because they promised him freedom for it. And he wanted to have the freedom, but he always thought that this is just a period of time and it would pass. He still didn't want to believe that they would actually separate us or hurt us physically or actually take it away, be taken away. And, uh, no. and also, uh, my father, prior to 1939, he had a beard and he was traveling a lot and he had a, a a Yaris card, that means uh, a ticket which it was good for a year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after that, he couldn't travel anytime he wanted to anymore, and he was forced to cut the beard off so he wouldn't be recognized as a Jew. And his freedom was taken away from him. And, uh, and he was also afraid in a way, not so much afraid, but uh, felt very bad that he uh, lo is losing his recognition by knowing how much he did for the economy. Mm -hmm. And he still believed that things will change. Now, what other civil liberties were taken away from you from 39 to, let's say, 43, 44? Well, I couldn't... Uh, I had a curfew. I had to be home before dark. Because if I tried to go into town or something, I was beaten up, and I was in my father and mother. They, they wanted to protect us, of course, so they forbid us. And I also, a lot of times, even during the day when I came home from school, I had to have somebody, an adult, waiting for us after school and guide us home because they were afraid that, because the kids were just beaten up on us. Ukrainian kids. Ukrainian kids. And also, we, instead of uh, going to school every day like other kids did, sometimes they used us for cleaning the streets in the school hours, which another kid would, would, have, uh, would have a chance to learn something. And in our cases, we had to work physically um, by telling us the reason that you clean the streets is because you're a Jew, and we hate Jews, and we are going to kill all the Jews. And, uh, and you shouldn't have lived till now. And, uh, and always, they always made us feel that we will never be as good as they are and that we are not gonna survive for too long. Did you see much of your other family besides your immediate family during that time? Well, prior to that, uh, we had, I had uncles, uh, my father's brothers and aunts, and they used to come to come to visit us, and which did not live in the same town, and they used to visit us very regularly. But after that, we never seen them. We maybe seen them once a year, and even that once a year, we had to have guards when they came to protect them, which of course we hired ourselves. Could you tell me their names, your uncles, your aunts? Well, do you remember? Yeah, my one of my uh, father's brother. His name was Yassel, and. Uh, and then there was uh, my aunt, uh, which it was his wife, and her name was Gietl. And then there was another brother of my father's, and his name was 
was uh, was uh, Hirsch, uh, Hershey, and his the f wi his wife's name was Sarah, and then there was uh, one uncle, which it was my f my mother's. He married my mother's sister, and he lived in the same town, and he had a little store, and his name was Yossel Mayrovich. And uh, of course, my grandfather from my mother's side lived in the same town, and his name was. Uh, uh, I always, I, I always, I forget his name, uh, Simcha Yassel. Yes, yeah, two first name, and my grandmother's uh, name was uh, Reisel, which in English is Rachel. How old were you around this time now? In uh, 39? Well, in 39, I was 11 years old. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about the business that your father's business now during this period from 39 to 43. Well, my father was still in the same business, <coughs> but he was. Uh, the employees did not try as hard, and he was. Uh, they. Uh, they stole a lot. Uh, they used to sell on the side logs. They used to sabotage the... Because in order to get a timber down from the woods, you had to shoot, you in, and it, so it came by water down, uh, because you could not go with a wagon and horses to pull it up because of the, of the mountains. So they used to sabotage the chutes, so they broke, and the logs were lost, the timber was lost. They used to sabotage the equipment from the sawmill. They used to specify in their hourly hours that they that they produced more, but it never the inventory never showed up as uh, what they turned in for payment for. So it was embezzled. A lot of embezzling went on. It was a lot of embezzlement. So the authorities wanted more production, and he was getting less because of everything else. Right, and also, and because of that, they said uh, that that is not true because they always defended. They said that he was just not trying hard enough, or he's not smart enough anymore, and he just doesn't care enough. And this is what the blackmail came in with the interrogation, and he got always scared and. And also, he was abused uh, physically also. Did you see? Uh, I did not see. It was kept for me. But I found that out uh, because I know he was interrogated at home in our villa. But I didn't know that he was abused physically because it was kept for me, who, who I was the youngest, from the boys and for the two sisters. But the brother in Denver, he told me that when he got off the train, which in that time, a lot of times, because in that time they already forbid Jews to do business. And by boarding the train and coming back in the train, they knew that he must have done some business. So he was taken off the train and taken into the gendarmes, uh, like the police mm -hmm. station, and actually he was abused physically uh, by being beat up. And in that time, not so much uh, s sometimes on his face too, but for us younger kids, like for me or for myself, he says that he fell and all that. So he didn't want us, he didn't, he didn't want to tell us that he was abused, but my oldest brother, my older brothers, they knew. Okay. Now let's move ahead to January 44. What happened right before then and tell me a little bit about that period now. Well, they, they didn't give us too much notice that they were going to take us away. <laughs> and as I say, prior to that, he still had a lot of good friends between the Gentile people, between uh, people who worked for my father. And they actually always uh, told my father that you should try to do something because they will, they might take you away and they might prosecute you. And they offered to hide us out. And of course, my father didn't accept. And of course, one day in the, in the evening, it was announced that the Jews had to be ready in the morning because in the morning, they, and not to take anything with you, just only what you can carry. 
uh, because you're not allowed to put it on any wagons to haul or something. And usually what we only carried with us is uh, just clothing and, and, we, and they marched us to the railroad station and we boarded a train and, they, and we went to Matasalka, which, it was a, which was a town in Hungary. And there, they, this was the ghetto. And uh, of course, uh, in the beginning, they unloaded us on an empty field, and it was uh, put on uh, like a circus tent. And all of us, the whole town, and also we picked up some other Jews from the neighboring towns after the train stopped. And it was not a passenger train, it was a freight train. And so when we got there, they, they guided us to that empty field. Were there any non-Jews there? Uh, no. Just the Jews? Just the Jews. And then they started to process us uh, to not like uh, private homes. It's just that on the attic of different buildings. And uh, so already in that time, we were separated as a family. We did not stay in the same building. I remember that uh, my, uh, me and my older brother were together, and then uh, the second oldest brother were the two sisters and my father and mother. So we were, but we were in the same neighborhood. And, uh, and of course, uh, and also they stripped us from everything. They threatened us. Uh, first of all, they stripped us from what we had as far as jewelry. But they threatened us in case they will find something in our clothing, then they would uh, punish us very severely and might even be as dead. So we actually handed over and away everything to them. And then one morning, uh, without any notice, uh, they woke us up like, like four in the morning and they guided us to the train. Now, going back a little bit, yeah. isn't that when you changed your name? Yeah, well, actually, when, we ch when I changed my name is because when they, when they took us to the ghetto, there were already rumors that they will separate families. And in order for us to make an attempt, hoping that we would be lucky enough and, and maybe stay together, uh, a few of us from the family changed their names. And now my name in the concentration camp was Mayerovich, which it was my uncle's last name, who married my mother's sister. Uh, but in the concentration camp, you didn't have a name to, at all. Mm -hmm. All you had is a number. They did not call you by your name. Tell me a little bit about the um, life in Matasalco for the, the month that you were there. The life in Matasalco, you were actually, uh, you were tortured uh, physically. You were cleaning the streets in, in town. They fed you... Uh, very, very little. It's just that my, we took some food with us because uh, my mother used to dry bread. I don't know how you call that, so it would stay longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hid that and we used to eat that uh, in hiding in a way because if anybody would have seen us and reported us, they would have taken it away. Mm -hmm. And that was hidden in our clothes. But uh, as far as hunger was concerned, we already started to feel hungry in the ghetto. And, uh, what things did you do specifically? Were, th were you abused there, or do you remember instances that happened to you specifically during that month? Well, I was abused because I wasn't allowed to go out and play. Mm -hmm. And also, I was, uh, they, they were counting us continuously, every building. Uh, a few times a day, they had us come down. I mean, they made an announcement that this and this building should come down, and, and, we can't if, and they wanted to find out if any of us escaped. Mm -hmm. And we were, they counted us. And of course, the abuse was uh, by lining us up for the count. There was a lot of abuse. Even so, we rushed as fast as we could. To start, but they hit us with rubber hoses, you know, and they called us that we do hurry up or be fast and so on. And not, uh, just for the, for the abuse itself. Who were these people the, that were those abusing were, you? Those were, still, those were still Hungarians. They were Hungarian 
soldiers, police. They were Hungarians, gendarmes, mm -hmm. what they Gendars. called. They were the ones who had the feathers mm -hmm. in their hats. And those actually were more abusive in a way than the German soldiers themselves. Because the German, the, there was no Nazis, there was no Gestapo in the ghetto. The Gestapo came in when, when we were in the concentration camp. But uh, the soldiers were more or less uh, fighting men as far as, uh, as far as the war is concerned. But the abuse of people were the, were the Hungarian police, mm -hmm. which were ordered, of course, by the, by the Germans. Mm -hmm. to, they were in charge of us. Now, you saw beatings and, and killings when you were there in Matasalco. Did you see people? I've seen people collapsing from, from uh, abuse, fainting from abuse. And I saw people that I saw today, and then the next day I hadn't seen them. What happened to those people, I don't know. But I, I saw by that they were abused, and I saw that they collapsed. And, and I was too young uh, to realize that the person probably is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know news of what was happening uh, east to the Jews, for example? Did you know what was going on in, in Poland at that time? We knew a little. We didn't know much because uh, you were not allowed to, to read newspapers. If they caught you with a newspaper, they put you in jail. A Jew was not allowed to read the press. We only knew which what, as much as it was said to us. And also some of it we heard on the radio, which we were not even allowed to listen to radio, but some of the, of the Gentile friends that my father had, they were the ones who gave my father some of the news that, uh, that the Polish Jews were, were all already, so we knew that the Polish Jews were already in, in, in the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. Your father did c communicate outside the ghetto. He still had connections. No, then? no. This no. was before the, before the ghetto. Uh, but in the ghetto, he didn't. In the know ghetto, anything. no. He, because you, the Gentiles. First of all, it's not. It wasn't anymore the same town. It was Matysolko, right. and then the Gentiles, even towards then before the ghetto, they were still, in a way, hiding to be my father to be friends because they didn't want to s be seen by the other Gentiles because they were afraid that they would report them because it was against the rules to be a friend mm -hmm. of a Jew. Uh, but at, by, by the ghetto, we were completely isolated from the people from our town. And everyone you dealt with through the Romanian... Uh, right, everyone I dealt with, uh, but there were no Romanians because there was, it was a Hungarian. Hungarian police, right. I'm sorry. But everyone I knew there, uh, they were strangers to us. We'd never seen them before. Okay, now take us right up to February, March, 1944. You were talking about one morning. Well, one morning they uh, woke us up and they put us in line and we, st and we walked to the railroad station. And they loaded us in. What did you take with you? Uh, actually, nothing because they did not they didn't allow from the ghetto whatever we had, our personal belongings, like those. They didn't allow that for us to take anything, because th there was not, and we did not ride in passenger cars. We rode in uh, freight cars, and so you couldn't take anything with you. Uh, just what you had on you, and they load us. Uh, in other words, you did not have enough room to sit down. Everybody was standing. And they load in people as much as possible by standing there. How many were in a car, would you say? I have, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I would say <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard for me to tell at that age. Mm -hmm. 100 or more. Okay. And uh, there was no laboratory facilities. They put in a, a, a drum, a, a steel drum. And if you had to relieve yourself, uh, you, there was no shame of it, you know. And it was, it was just after, uh, well, we started like four in the morning, by, by 10 in the morning or noon in the morning, you already started to feel like an animal, no way. Because they, the train did not make a stop on every, on every town. 
only on the major towns, and at that time they only opened the door a little to get a little fresh air, not enough to to uh, to get some new oxygen or to get rid of the smell, just for a very short time. And then the the, fir and the only time which they opened the door completely, and they asked us to get out, was when we reached uh, Birkenau. Did you know ahead of time where you were going to be no, going? No, no, nobody. What did they that. tell you when they put you on the train? They didn't tell us anything. Just said get they on. They called train. us name and they beat us and they and they insulted us with uh, with uh, anti-Semitic words like uh, "dirty Jew" and and uh, you'll never see your home again. It's about time we get rid of you and all that. Who were you with in the car of your family? Uh, I was in the car, with, in the, uh, the same car with my whole family. And uh, you mean at the radar, yeah. with my whole family. But my older si my, my sister, who was younger than I was, but the older sister, she was actually sick at that time. She, she needed surgery uh, in the ghetto, uh, appendix, because she had very, and they did not want Which to take it. Which, there was Hannah? Uh, Hannah Gitlo. Okay. Yeah. And they did not. They did not. They refused to take her to the hospital to perform the surgery on her. And actually, she got on the train in pain. Uh, she was capable of walking. Of course, we helped her stand up and walk. And as soon as we got to Birkenau, they separated right away the men from the women. How long was the trip? I remember that we. It was like two days and a night. I remember we were through the whole night and during the day. It was, I would say, like two days and a night. And how did you feel during the, the, those 48 hours or so? We felt that, uh, we, that we would never see our town again. Uh, all we wanted is just to, to be able to breathe. To be and to be able to smell fresh air, we knew that uh, that like my father before felt, hey, this is not going to last long. That this, we knew right there that this is not going to stop. In other words, that we are not going to get back home at any time. Uh, and also prior to that, we we heard the news because it was. It was forced for us to listen to the news, and every time the news was reported, it was telling us how how Germany advances, and how they succeed and everything. And, uh, and uh, so we knew that it wasn't something like they would be invaded within a day and we would be free. Now on the train there were German guards at that point. Yes, on the train there were German guards, but the guards were not in the in the cars where we were riding. The guards were standing on every car. The steps, they were standing on each side, there was a guard uh, with, with, uh, with rifles. Okay, now you arrived in? We arrived after you got out of the train. In Birkenau. In Birkenau. You remember morning, afternoon? It was in the afternoon. And this was in March? And this was, this was in, yeah, this was in March. Of 19? Of 1944. And? Uh, Tell me what happened then. Well, like I say, they separated us, and, and right away I, I didn't, I only saw my brother, I was only with my brother who is in Denver now, who mm -hmm. was not in the same concentration camp as I was. Okay. And uh, How was this all done? What, what happened like off the train? Well, first they, they, they had us, they took us into a, to a building, and they said that we were going to, and we had us take the clothes off, and we had to take a shower. After the shower, and we came out to the other end, so they were already clothes provided for us, the striped clothes. We couldn't put back our own clothes. They gave us striped clothes. And of course, they had to stand the line, and they took us to different barracks. And we were in Birkenau. Uh, I think it was no more than a day or two. I was not longer than that. I found out that my brother, who, is in, who lives in Denver now, he tells me that he was in Birkenau a few weeks before they placed him to a camp. Me, they took the next day, 
to Auschwitz. We, they, they lined up a lot of people and we walked. Mm -hmm. Funberg and I, not by train, we walked to Auschwitz. Now I want to go back to your mother and sister. Do you remember how that whole thing Yeah, I never seen when, when we got off the train, they put the women and children separate. These were German guards? These were, that was already German guards. The SS? The SS. That was already the Gestapo, the SS. And uh, that was the last time I saw my mother. And of course we started to yell to each other and cry. And we made attempt, like I made attempt to run to my sisters and hug them. And I, uh, that was my first uh, feel of um, abuse when I was hit with a rubber and, and ordering me to go back to that site. And mm. that was the last time I saw my, my sisters and, my, and uh, my mother and actually even my father. And my, uh, my father, who was in the same camp with me, we did not come to the same camp at the same time. Mm -hmm and my oldest brother. I met him already when I was in the camp. And you were about 15, 16? You know, um, yes, I was, yeah, 15. Okay, now, did you go with your brother and your fathers from the, um, when, the when the they did the separation? You went by yourself now? They, they put us in groups together. Were you when with they, family then? Yeah, uh, they put us in groups and it was so rushy that you didn't, you didn't have a chance to say anything or to look around anything because they, they, they put you in different groups and they ordered you right away. So you didn't have a chance to look around and see is my father in the same group, because they didn't. It was they pr they rushed you so much. So you were separated almost right so away. So I was separated almost right away because they say I did not see I did not know that my father I did not see my father until. I, uh, until I was in Yavishowitz. Now they were all Jews at this time? They they were, all, uh, the whole train was Jews. Okay. Did they do any separation of the men at that point? You mean the older men? Older and younger, young? yeah. Well, the, the very old man, because I, my grandfather from my mother's side was in the same train, mm -hmm. and, and my grandmother. And uh, they separated. The, I didn't see separating my sisters from my mother. But the old men and women, they separated also. I saw that the, my grandfather was told to go one side, and they did not start putting them in line to go for a shower. And, and uh, because after we left to take the shower, of course, I lost sight of my, of my grandfather and grandmother. And younger, younger boys and, and girls? And, little, and right away, the kids were taken away, the kids who were crying, babies, they were taken away from their mother's arms. And if the mother was refused, or was all right, the mother got insulted physically. What and was the oldest age, youngest age of boys that we'd say were with you that were sent to the camps? With me? That were uh, sent over. Yeah, I would say uh, like my age, around 13, 14. Not much younger? Not much younger, no. No, not much younger. Because they told us that when I came to the camp, I realized there was just very few my age but none of them younger, none of them younger. Than okay, so now you went through the shower and you're dressed. What happens then? Okay, then we marched to Auschwitz. And uh, in Auschwitz, we got in in the afternoon, and then we had to line up, uh, and we got tattooed. Would you like to show your, can yeah. you show your number and, and read it off, please? We could have just a close-up of that. You may want to turn your hand a little bit. Yeah. Okay, the number is A4524. And that was the name what I had from then on. I was not called anymore Samuel Farkas. I was called by this name. Could you hold your arm up, please? You want to turn it a little bit? Yeah, there. Good. Could you read the numbers again for me, please? A4524. Yeah, you can see there. That's good. Like yeah. that. Yeah. Do you remember this whole business, how this was done? What yes, we were standing in line and there were some uh, soldiers, uh, Gestapo SS, and they had uh, like pens and they dipped it in ink and they hit us with a point. Till the, till it was a number, mm -hmm. 
And after it was done, they they shoved you to a side and then they got the did next it, one. Did it hurt? Yes, it hurt. Mm -hmm. But uh, by that time, the hurt was already in a way minor because you were already used to, prior to that, to a more physical abuse than this hurt. So this hurt was very minor. Did they do anything else to your body? They shave your hair? Yeah, well, after, uh, say, after we, when we, uh, when we got, uh, after the shower, they didn't shave our hair, but when we got to Birkenau after the shower, as right away, we had to stand in line and they, they cut our hair. And, uh, How long were you in Auschwitz? In Auschwitz, it was only uh, like from late in the afternoon till the following morning. Can you describe that day to me? You were very... Well, in the evening, you were tattooed. And then you, you were given uh, a slice of bread that uh, I would say uh, maybe an inch thick and maybe six inches long and maybe three inches wide. And if you wanted something with the bread, like in a, in a, in a, a teaspoon of jam. Uh, but if you wanted something to drink with the bread, like coffee, there was a separate line to go to. And you had to stand in line with a lot of people. Uh, and by the time, and I noticed by standing in line, that some of them, which they got the coffee, by the time they worked themselves back, you know, they lost the coffee anyway for the pushing. So I didn't even make an attempt to, to get the coffee. And uh, so I just had that piece, uh, that piece of bread with the jam. And they, uh, they gave us, they, they gave us bunk bed. They placed us in a room which said, okay, and we were in line. They said, okay, this is yours and this is yours. And they placed me in front of a bunk bed, which it was, uh, the bunk beds were three on top of each other. And I had the upper berth. And around uh, three in the morning, they woke us up, had us get dressed and stand in line. And uh, we marched to this concentration camp, which it was about 10 kilometers from Auschwitz. It was called Javishowitz. And that was a coal mine camp. And because all the people in that camp, uh, most of the people worked in the coal mine. And of course, uh, the following, uh, they placed us in a barrack. And the following morning, I already knew that I would have to go to work and I would be working on the morning shift. And at four o'clock, we were woken up and stood in line and we walked from the camp to Yavishovitz. And then we went with an elevator, with a lift down, and I, I heard it was 280 feet on the ground. And that's uh, where I worked. And my work was in a place which it was called the Streep. That was a section that you, it was only five feet high. You couldn't work uh, standing up. I had to work on my knees. And in the beginning, I had nothing to protect my knees, but after a while, they gave us pads. Uh, but they only gave us one pad, and after it uh, got wore off, uh, we had to make our own pads from the racks. And, uh, and my job was, uh, I had a supervisor over me, and he was not uh, a concentration camp. He did not live in concentration camp. He was a civilian man. He was a Polish man, and... Uh, Did he ever tell you his name? No, no. And my job was, he was the one who dynamited the coal by putting some dynamite, and after, and my job was is to scoop up the coal and load it to small cars, and it had small tracks. And after that little car was loaded up, I pushed that little car to an area which by automatically it tilted over and the coal emptied into a chute, to a curvair, and the coal went down to an area which it was, and there was regular railroad cars in that area. And, and then of course again I had to pull the empty car back and load it up again and, 
and this was an all it was done uh, on my knees except when I pushed the car I was bent down and pushed it because I had to push the little car hold on to it on top of it on top I couldn't push it on the bottom and about after uh, three or four months after that I had and I had a kerosene lamp which provided me with light and uh, about three four months later my kerosene lamp went dead on me and I didn't and I I was I couldn't see anything and I didn't know when that car will tilt over to empty itself so one of my hands were pressed when the car tilted it was pressed against the ceiling and it cut me completely these three fingers and that happened like around 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now let, let's go yeah. back a little yeah. bit before we go there. I want to, did you have ever lunch during the, uh, tell me a little bit about the day um, okay. and, and yeah. this, this foreman that worked over you. Okay. In the morning, when, before you left the camp, you left the camp around four in the morning because the coal mine had three shifts. They were going 24 hours a day. At four in the morning, you left the camp and you were given a slice of bread, which was about the same size as I described before. Sometimes you had a piece of jam with it. Sometimes you had a piece of margarine with it. And as far as the coffees, and you were given that in your own barrack. And it was given out by the supervisor of the barrack. But if you wanted coffee with it, you had to do the same thing. You had to go to the dining and stand in line for the coffee. And you had very little time because after they woke you up, you had a half an hour to wash and to have the little bread and, and stand the line. Because half an hour later, you already had to stand the line to go to work. Tell me about the facilities of washing. Well, the facilities of washing was a washroom, which, uh, which it had faucets, but you, you cannot have, and it was a steel deal, and you bent over it, and you had a faucet, which you wash your hands, and but you couldn't use a faucet for yourself. There were two, three people crowding and using the faucet at the same time. But when you came home from work, then you were completely, you were, you were black from the cold. So there you had, you took a shower. And the showers also, you had a limited time for the time to spend in the shower. The showers were also shared by three, four other people. And there were guards after you took, came out for the shower. And you couldn't put on your clothes until the guard looked at you. And if he saw a speck of coal on you, he hit you to go back. And of course, if you still, and yet you had a limited time, but if you still were dirty, he just kept on hitting you till he got tired and let you go because he knew that you cannot spend more time there. So it was a torture. It was. Uh, Every time uh, you took a shower after now, that. Now, at this point, you're brought, you did have some family with you. Could you yeah, describe yeah. that a little bit? Well, I didn't realize that I had my oldest brother. His name was? And his name was Hirsch, Herschel. And my father in the same camp. For the first two weeks, I didn't know that. After two weeks, I found out because every two weeks, you had a Sunday off. And during the day of Sunday, you, the whole camp were counted, you were lined up. And then, by standing in line, I realized, because when they called my father's number, you, also, you always had to say, here, or yes, or yeah. And I recognized the voice from my older brother. And, and it just so happened that we were five in a row, and my father might have been, in, he was in the same five in a row, and then about six yard, five, six yards separate, and then another row of five. And it was in the same line except in the second section. I noticed when I heard that voice, I noticed that it's my father. And then when my brother's number was called, it was just in the back of me, in the same, in the same line, just maybe two or three rows in the back mm -hmm. of me. 
and I recognized his, his voice. And I just turned, and, and of course, right away, I made a point where they are, and after the count was over, after they called each other's name, of course, I went to both of them, and, I, and, and we were very happy to. And that was also the time that my older brother didn't know about me and my father. Mm -hmm. But I still couldn't see him. Did you recognize them when you saw them? Yes, I recognized them. And of course, uh, our heads were shaved, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and it wasn't actually, you didn't have a chance to lose too much weight because mm -hmm. it was only, as I say, it was only mm -hmm. after we got Few, there. Yeah. But you could tell, you could already see the, the paleness in the face and the stress and especially in my father. I think what we'll do is take a break now. Okay, I appreciate okay, that. Okay, and then we'll continue. Thank you. Okay. Before we go forward, um, I'd like to go back to 1939, and I want to talk a little bit about how the Jews were identified then, and if you can tell me a little bit about how that process happened. Okay. First of all, it was a small town, and all, there was only about 200 Jews, and all the Jews, uh, most of the, all the Jews were more or less Orthodox Jews. The Jewish kids, most of them were pious, they wore a cap and they were tzitzes. But, the, but on top of that, they, they publicized, they ordered the Jews to register. And they, and they threatened that if a Jew will fail to register in the State Department in that town, and then after they would find out that he was a Jew, and then they would kill him. So of course, uh, all the Jews registered. Were there any other identification, identification items or modes of identification then? Well, there were the birth certificate and the state. I mean, they say they knew even without ordering the Jews to register, they more or less, they knew who was Jewish and who wasn't. Um, you're because talking of the fact that it was a small so town. So these are the Hungarian authorities? These are the Hungarian authorities, but they also ordered them officially to register. Mm -hmm. Did you have any identifying marks when you would walk down the street that would let people know you were Jewish? Well, yes, because I myself and my brothers, we did wear, and you are talking about up to 39. Yeah, after 39. Uh, after 39. Well, right away, as they say, they didn't make us cut off the pious, but uh, a little after that, of course, we did ourselves mm -hmm. because they were abusing us by pulling us, you know, at the pious. And also they were trying to, they took our caps mm -hmm. off and throwing it and, uh, away. So you were an Orthodox? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, all family. the Jews, all the Jews in that town were Orthodox, were Orthodox Jews. All the Jews. In were they Hasidic town. Jews? Yeah. They were all Vishnitsa Hasidic, what they call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you wear a star at all at yes, any time? Yes. The star, of course, the stars, you didn't wear the star right away in 1939. When, but I would say around 1941 you had then uh, you had to wear a star to have a positive identification wherever you went that you were Jewish mm -hmm. even you cut off your pious and all that you still had to wear and it was of course a yellow star mm -hmm. okay well, let's move ahead again and now we're in um, uh, we're ahead we're going ahead now to 1944 and at this point, um, you're in the coal mines. Um, the Polish foreman, tell me a little bit about your interactions with him and, and um, how that in, in dealt with your normal day. The Polish foreman, he, he did not speak German. He spoke Polish only. Me being able to speak Czech, you still don't understand every word in Polish. 
So when he used to ask me to hand him a particular tool, like uh, a Faisal, which is a hammer, uh, and, but in Polish it's a Faisal, and if I handed him like a tuba four, he'd throw it at me, or vice versa. And he used to physically abuse me every day. And after I learned uh, the names of those tools, and I handed him the right tools. He would beat you? He would beat me. With a right. tool, with his hands? He would beat me, he would slap me with his hands. He would beat me with two by fours. He would throw pieces of coal at me. And he would, at times, he would knock me out. And at times, I would come home bloody. Did you ever uh, think of doing something to him? Or were you afraid? Or He was bigger than I was. And uh, he would have killed me if I would have raised my hand. Uh, no, I never tried. Mm -hmm. But I was always hoping that he would stop that. But after a while, when I learned, when I knew the names of those tools, and I also learned to speak Polish a little, because there was a lot of Polish Jews in the same barracks as I was, and they talked sometimes, and also Polish non-Jews, uh, political prisoners, whatever they are. So I knew, and it's not, it wasn't too hard for me to learn Polish because I do speak Czech. So one time I told him, I says, uh, why do you beat me? I says, what did I ever do to you? I am hungry all the time. I'm abused in the camp. I come here and am with you 12 hours a day. Why do you beat me? And he says, well, he says, uh, if you want me to stop beating you, and I might even bring you some food, he says, bring me some shirts. Because, and then he told me that he has five children, and he doesn't make enough working in the coal mine. And if I could help him financially by bringing him shirts, and he would sell them and turn it into food, whatever. So then I told him, I says, you wouldn't want my shirts, because I says, if they would see your children for shirts, they would shoot you before they would even question, they would think that you were escaping because the clothes, what we were, and the shirts, they were all striped and only the concentration camp people were. He says, I don't mean your shirts. I mean civilian shirts. And he says, I know that you, that the SS, the Gestapo has a, a laundry room in your camp, which they laundry their shirts. And up, t yeah. How long was the was your day there? Did you work? Well, we left at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but how long did you work? And we worked till four o'clock in the afternoon. And by six, uh, we, it, and at six o'clock, we returned back to the camp. Okay, how long so was the march? Uh, uh, from, from the, it was I would say about forty-five to an hour. Mm -hmm. Did you and have I was, lunch? I was fourteen hours away from the camp, but, but you didn't get anything to eat. All you had is that piece of bread in the morning when you left, and then when you returned to the camp, after you had the shower, you got a bowl, the little soup, and the soup was served to you from drums. Okay, the guy who served the soup, he did not bother to stir up the soup. So if you were lucky, you got to the bottom of the barrel, you had something in the soup. If you got to the top of the barrel, it was just like water. And that was the diet for the day. Okay. Now, what happened now with the shirts? Tell, let's go back and... So when he told me that, uh, that he knows that the uh, SS, you stop, they have a laundry there and they do the laundry, the civilian shirts there, which uh, up to that time, I didn't know it because, but he was right. There was a utility building. There was a small building, which it was about 20 feet high. And on top, about 18 feet from the ground, there was a little window. And the pipe for the machine, what laundry, for the steam to go out, came through that window. It was 20 feet high, the window? And the window was about 18. The building was about 20 feet high. 18 feet 18 high. 18 feet from the ground was the window, which the steam, which that pipe that came up. And of course, the building had a front entrance, 
which it had a padlock plus a regular lock. And right across, they had a guard. In other words, they were guards all around the uh, towers. And every tower had an assess with a rifle. And they had a view of that particular area for the camp. And right across that utility building, it just so happened that there was one of the towers. And I knew that there is no way, first of all, the building was locked. And there is no, if I would ever make an attempt to break the door or something, they would see me. But yet, when I told him that, he actually increased his abuse by telling me that he doesn't care how. And if I would try hard enough, I would. he didn't want to have any excuses. Then I realized that if I wouldn't do something and I couldn't get transferred, because you cannot just go to your cop or advice and say, I want to work somewhere else. So I knew actually if I don't do anything, he would eventually kill me. And actually, I prayed to God every night when I went to bed not to get up in the morning because I was so tired of abuse and hunger. And I just considered it more of a torture. It would, it would take longer for him to kill me. So I prayed to God not to get up. But then I realized I knew that there is a lot of people probably which would be in the same position as I was because I heard that a lot of people who worked in the coal mine, their supervisor, their, their, their civilian, they are asking things from them. And, uh, but then you were afraid to, uh, to approach anybody because I knew that there's no way I can reach that window by myself. So I had to have at least three, four other people to help me. And also, you did not. Know, you also knew that that guard, that tower who faces the utility building, he is not there 24 hours a day because the guards, every shift what came in from the, from the coal mine, some of the guards abandoned their towers, and they took care of the showers. They guarded the people who took showers, and the whole thing, you only had about 20 minutes for a shift to take a shower. But I knew that those 20 minutes, the guard would be gone. But I didn't know when. So one time, I stayed up all night. And I, and I was hoping that during the night, it would be, that it wouldn't be something from the, grave, from the swing shift, that it would be something from the graveyard shift that that uh, man would have been. So I found out <laughs> that at midnight, when the swing shift came in, he abandoned the tower. And it, and, I, and it was like I say, it was like 20 minutes because the reason I knew, because the building what had the, the kitchen where they served the soups, that building had a clock. So you knew the time. <coughs> so, but then I felt there's no way I can do it by myself. And in a way, I was, uh, even in that age, in a way, I was more advanced in my way of thinking because of the fact that my father, we had private schools and, and by that time already had a good education and no more like the average kid would know. <coughs> so then, <coughs> excuse me. Then I felt if I can find a few people and I felt that we could get together three, four of us and we would stand on top of each other, then one of us could reach the window and go out. But yet you were scared to approach anybody. Because if you approach the wrong person, and if they would tell on you, they would take you to the gas chamber right there. So one time I took a chance and I approached three gypsies. And they were actually gypsies because they were, uh, I could hear them talk Hungarian between them. And they were dark skinned. And I speak Hungarian because when the Hungarians came in, I also went to, we had to go to the Hungarian school. Did they have different identification? No, they had different identification on your clothes. I mean, uh, the, the Jews had a different identification. Non-Jews had a different. What did you have on your clothes? Like a three, st yeah, uh, like a star there, and they had a three star, three corner okay. deal. Do you remember their names? Can well, you? one of them was Shandor, and one of them was Shani. Two of them were brothers, and one of them was their friend. But they were all, all three from the same town. So I asked him. I says, "Do you?" 
do you, are you hungry all the time? And he says, who isn't? I says, would you, do you have a supervisor who would give you some food if you would give him something? So they told me the same thing, that yes, but they says, uh, we cannot give him anything because we don't have anything. So I told him, I says, I have a supervisor uh, that he wants civilian shirts. And I says, if you would have civilian shirts and if you would give it to your supervisor, he probably will give you something to eat. And if you could help me, I have a plan. And I says, I would even volunteer to be the one who would go into the building. And I told him I already researched that this guard when this is post at midnight when the swing shift comes in. And I says, and we would have 20 minutes. And I says, and I would uh, throw out some shirts. And we were to all together, we were four of us. And I says, I would throw out 16 shirts, four for each. And once I would throw out the 16 shirts, I would climb up the machine and let you, and you would see me. And then you would stand up with each other, and I would come down. And all everything was understood, and we set a time and everything. And I went in, everything went fine. I started throwing out shirts. And I counted, and I threw out 16 shirts. And then I climb up the machine, and I said, OK, you guys. And I look down, and nobody is there. They grabbed their part of their shirts, and they got panicky. And of course, I had to jump. And I excuse my expression, I jumped. I shat in my pants from jumping 18 feet and being skinny and weak. How much did you weigh then? I weighed in that time around 74, 76 pounds. And when I landed, I couldn't get up. But I knew if I don't get up, pretty soon the guard will come and see me. And luckily enough, there wasn't too far away from there, I would say maybe 150 yards from there was the washroom. So I went. I actually couldn't stand up and walk, but I was crawling. Yeah, and I grabbed my four shirts and I put it inside of my shirt. And I was crawling to the washroom and washed myself off and got to my bag. So it wasn't hard to hide the shirts because this you, sl you didn't have a mattress. You had straw. But in the blanket that you covered yourself, after when you got up, you pulled it over the straw. But under the straw, nobody ever checked you because nobody had anything. So I felt I'm going to put the shirts onto the, on the straw. And then the next morning, I will tell my supervisor that I have something for him. And of course, after that, it was a problem to get it out. Because every morning when you stood in line to go to work, you were searched, not by humans, not by the Gestapo, dogs. We were five in a line. The dog went to every line and smelled you. German shepherds. The German shepherds. They were, they were trained to smell your scent, your clothes. The laund when they laundered your clothes, had a special scent. If they smelled any other scent on you, they tore you apart. They, they jumped on you. And, and of course, right away, mm -hmm. a Gestapo came, and they knew yeah. that you. So you saw that? And I saw that, because I saw that many times before from other people. But in a way, my luck was they did not give you shoes. I have a very small foot, seven size. And they didn't give you shoes to fit your, uh, your size. So they gave me a pair of shoes wooden, with wooden soles, which was about three, four sizes bigger than my size was. So I used to fill in, I used to wrap around racks the same type of rags what my shirt was, to fill in the emptiness so I can wear the shoes. So I felt, hey, this is great, because I can use a shirt, a civilian shirt, and then wrap around one of the rags just to cover. And the scent will still be my scent. And this is how I smuggled out the, the shirts to my supervisor. After that, of course, for about, oh, I would say about three weeks. He brought me every day a little soup. When he had lunch, he had me stop. Because prior to that, I worked through all the time, but he stopped and ate. And he gave me a piece of bread and soup. And after uh, about three weeks or so, he asked me to do the same thing. And of course, there's no way 
those gypsies wanted to do it again, and there is no way I could do that by myself. So in a way, I was lucky because right after that, I had an accident. You had the accident with yeah, your finger. With my finger, which mm -hmm. I explained to right. you. Now, before we, let's go back before we go to the accident. Tell me a little bit about the barracks that, that you were in and the makeup of the people that were in the camp. Well, the barracks were, uh, there was bunk beds, three, and very, very close, actually, very close to each other. After three sets of bunk beds, there were a little aisle, and then another three mm -hmm. sets. Three. And the aisle was just wide enough for you to get down. And uh, I would say there was, in one barrack, I would say there was about, you know, two, three hundred people. Mm -hmm. And they were all in your barrack were all Jewish? Uh, yeah. In my barrack they were all Jews and they were all working in the in the coal mine. But the kapo was not. And but the kapo from the barrack, no, the kapo was not. And the kapos mm -hmm. in charge on the grounds on the, uh, were also not Jews. Mm -hmm. And of course the uh, the people in the dining in the in the kitchen uh, were not Jews. And the people who hand out the the piece of bread for you in the morning uh, were not Jews. And the gypsies were kept in a separate barrack? And no, the gypsies, they were mixed. Uh, so all, they were all mi they were mixed. Uh, as long as you were in the concentration camp, they did not separate you. You could have been, I could have been with gypsies in the same barrack. So there were gypsies, Jews, what else? Right. And Polish people and Lithuanians and Russians. And they were there because of? And they were there for, uh, for political reasons mm -hmm. and uh, maybe because they well, they didn't like Hitler, mm -hmm. or they uh, or they opened their mouth. Mm -hmm. I guess. I and guess the so. age the age range in your camp? Uh, the age range in the uh, age range it was I would say anywhere from my age to about to around fifty. Okay. Your father was already one of the old. Uh, yeah, ones. because my father was not even fifty years old in that time. Okay. Now, t now we'll jump ahead again to the uh, accident in the mine when you're with your fingers. Tell. Let's talk about what happened there. Well, when I had the accident, I explained to you before how it happened, and that happened like around 10 in the morning, but they still did not let me go back to camp. I had to wait till the shift was over, in a pool of blood, you know, in the pain, and then, and then I went with the rest of the shift back home to the camp. Of course, after I got to the camp, I went to the hospital, to the medical station, and the diagnosis, first, there was a head doctor who was not Jewish, and he gave the di he he gave his diagnosis and ordered for the other doctors what to do with triage. You. Did you yeah. what do you know what he was or who he was? He was a Polish man. But you don't know his name. No, I don't okay. know his name. And then he ordered, and then he he looked at my fingers, which of course it was all bloody and they was just hanging. And he looked at it, and then he calls one of the doctors, and I think that that doctor was a Jew, and he orders him to cut off my fingers. So he took me to a separate room, and he says, you heard the order, but, uh, and then he looked again at my finger, he says, but I feel that those fingers could be saved, but I don't have any anesthetic or anything, anything to give you. If you can stand pain, I will try to sew them up. So it's up to you. And I said, yes. So in order to be ensured that I will not scream, I remember he put a rack in my mouth. And he, and this is, he took a plain needle and thread and started sewing together the pieces. And of course, it was very, very painful. But, but by that time, you were used to pain because my back felt just like leather. Uh, because, uh, say, a lot of times by walking to the coal mine, if you saw a rotten apple on the street, you broke out the line to grab it. And most of the time, before you had a chance to swallow it, they hit you, and you lost the apple anyway. So pain, in a way, didn't mean much. And, of course, and then they bandaged up my arm, and then they guided me into the hospital. And that's when I found my father. And I asked my father, what are you doing here? And he told me he got hurt. Also, he also worked in the coal mine. And he worked by supporting the construction and by the water mains. 
and a piece of wood, and it fell on his shoulder and hurt his shoulder. And he was, by that time, he was already in the hospital for three days. And there was a rule in the camp that uh, if you, the limit for you to stay, to be sick or stay in hospital was seven days. And if you were not capable after the seven days to go to work, then automatically you were taken to the gas chamber. Now, how often did the, um, to the, the gas medical team from Auschwitz come by? Every two weeks. The, the, a medical team from Auschwitz came, and the, it usually was in the evenings. And they had you strip every barrack, I know the people in the right, they had you strip completely nude, and they looked at you. And if you looked too skinny, too old, and they saw that they couldn't get too much more labor out of you, they, they, did, they asked you, they ordered you not to put your clothes back on, just stand in line, stand to the side without your clothes on. And then trucks backed up to the, and they loaded you on the truck and they took you to the gas chamber, nude, on the open truck, not closed in truck, just uh, open How truck. How did you know that they were going there? Because they never came back and because the fact that they, uh, that they loaded them nude and, and, and they knew. By then you knew already? That by then, by then we knew. By then we knew that a gas chamber existed, we knew everything. Okay, so now your father... So my father was there, and my father, they say, was already there three days when I got there, and he kind of felt pretty good. And, uh, and my father had golden teeth, not just fillings, but he uh, caps. caps. The prisoners in the concentration camp, they used to sell their gold fillings to their supervisors for food because you were very, very hungry. They made a rule which it was publicized, uh, bulletin boards all over the camp, that if you, if by the, when, and when the, the medical team, when they came every two weeks, they didn't just look at you how you look, they already knew this and this number has gold fill. They made you open the mouth and check if you still have it. And it was publicized in the bulletin board that if you sell a filling, automatically you go to the gas chamber. So the doctor who was in charge of that the part of that ward where me and my father were, he came to my father a day after I got there. And he asked my father for his gold teeth. What was his name? And his name was Harpash. And he was? And he was Romanian. You know where he was from? And, and he was, I thought that he was from Bucharest, but he was actually from Sakmar, which it was a town in Romania. And I get to it later, how I was trying to find him. Anyway, so my father told him, it's just like asking me for my life, because he says, you know. So he didn't say anything. He never mentioned it again, but he overextended his, my father's stay over the seven days. And on the eighth day, I saw a truck back up outside from the hospital, and they call out names from people to take their clothes off and get out, and my father was one of them. And of course, I cried and yelled, and I offered myself, you know, and I knew by that time, I already knew where my father was there. And from that time on... What did your father say to you then? And, well, prior to that, the worst thing, the hardest thing was for me to hear my father apologize to me. My father, when we met in the concentration camp, and again in the hospital, he, he felt very guilty by, he felt that it was his fault that we were prosecuted because he knew that we all knew how many people of our Gentile working people offered to hide us out. And he knew that the reason why, that, that it was his fault that he didn't allow it. 
because he was a great believer, like I said before. And he never thought that anybody would want to hurt us because of the contribution of what we made to the economy. And he apologized to me. He says, I'm very sorry that this happened. And that was the hardest thing to take. I wish he wouldn't have said that. But uh, anyway, then he was taken away. And again, he said it, of course, in the hospital. Uh, because we had some privacy at that time. And so when he was taken away, something in me changed. I didn't pray to God anymore that I not to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. I prayed to God to live. And for some reason, I just knew and hoping, because all I wanted is to kill the doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, and there's I another part to this about your older brother that happened around this time with your father. Could you relate that back to me? Well, my oldest brother was when we were marching, when we were evacuated. Because, you see, when the Russians, when the Russians got close, because the area was free, it was liberated. I'm talking about the one who worked at the camp in, in Auschwitz. You heard a story about one of your brothers. Well, that was already after the war. Yes, but I wanted you to tell me the story oh. about your father okay. and your brother. After the war, of course, I made a point to find out who is alive. And I found out that my second oldest brother, I was in the camp with my oldest brother and my father. My second oldest brother was in, in Auschwitz. His job was to guide the people to the gas chamber. When he recognized my father as being one of them, he included himself. And I wish he wouldn't ask that. <laughs> Take a minute. Yeah. Well, anyway, okay. So anyway, ask something else. I okay. Don't know. Now you're you're finishing the the hospital. You're in a, you you know you want to stay alive to kill this doctor. And now they take you away from the from the. Uh, coal mine and you're doing something else? Well, I am, after I, they put me in a, in a small group. There was only 24 of us, which we built swimming pools for the officers. I don't know if they were meant to be swimming pools. They told us, I mean, we were digging in the ground and it looked like a swimming pool. And it was 24 in the command. And we had four guards who took us to work every day and who watched us. And the guards, they didn't have anything to amuse themselves during the day. So they used to bring empty beer bottles, what they drink nights before and their friends drink. And they used to tie the beer bottles with rubber bands to our heads. And while we were digging in the ground and shoving, they shoot off the, the, the bottles. And there were many, many times that they hit your head and killed you. So the next day you were replaced with some, because it had to be 24 people. And I experienced that many times. And the feeling what you have when you hear something pop, especially when you already experienced many of them killed. Like for the first splits, for the few split seconds, you are like frozen. You actually don't know if you're alive or dead. And that was very terrifying time. And this went on for five or six months. And this went on actually, uh, no, it wasn't on for five or six months because so let's see, four, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and in, in, in the coal mine, yeah, about five, six months. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna go to January 45. Okay, in January 45, I think it was the 11th of January when they evacuated because you could hear days prior to that sounds of cannons from the, from the war. And the Germans uh, the, who were in charge of the camp, they didn't just evacuate, left themselves, they took us with them. And we were marching day and night without any food. 
How many people? And I think that that camp, I, I'm not sure, but I think it was about 5,000 people in that camp. And, uh, and if, you could, if you collapsed, if you couldn't walk anymore, they didn't try to revive you. They just shot you and rolled you down the gutter because the highways in that area was very narrow and the field, and they were built up higher. The fields were much lower. Mm -hmm. And I seen that after the first seven, eight hours, you already started to see people get shot like that. And you, and after, I would say, on the third day, before the third day was over, there was about 700 people left from the 5,000. And I myself, I was barely walking. And I was lucky, as I say, and I was with my oldest brother. And we were in the that same. That was Hirsch? That was Hirsch. And there were five people in line. And after every five lines, there was a guard on each side with a rifle. And there was one man, me, and then somebody else, and then my brother. And when I saw what's going on and how many people got killed, and knowing that I wouldn't be, and I knew that eventually it would, my turn will come. And I also I realized that every time when a, a military vehicle comes towards us, in order to allow the truck to pass, we had to step to the side because the highways were not like fire, you know, were very narrow. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that every time that happens in the night, it kind of blends your vision because the headlights from the trucks. And, and I noticed during the day that we were walking through area which they were empty fields, you know, uh, farm fields. And I also noticed that there were some holes in the ground. And it was obvious to me that those were foxholes where soldiers fought. And I also knew that those holes probably were abandoned. So I was trying to plan in my own mind to escape. And I knew that the best time, the best time it would be to wait till, till nightfall because in a way to, for the occasion when that truck would come blend the vision and I would just, and I only had one man who was, uh, and I would just roll down the gutter and make a run for one of those foxholes. So I told my brother, my oldest brother Hirsch, and I says, listen, I says, I have a plan. And I says, if you want to, you can join me and let's try for an escape. And I told him what, I says, let's wait till nightfall. He says, don't do it. They're going to shoot you. I says, who cares if they shoot me now or if they shoot me a few hours later? I says, I'm just telling you uh, that you know. And I says, you, you make up your own mind. But I says, I want you to know that I'm going to do it. And this is, in a way, another thing which I feel, I, I don't know, I believe in it, that my prayers, in a way, were answered. Because when I... When I escaped, when I rolled down the gutter, okay, a guard still saw me, but he was not about to roll down the gutter and catch me. So he still had enough time to take his shotgun and shot me. Shot me in the back, but I still made it to one of the foxholes. And I dove into a foxhole, which it was about five feet in diameter. But when I dove in, I would say about 60, 70 feet deeper, I, I fall into an area which it was uh, maybe 20 times as large as this little room is. And that was the food supply from that whole area. And it was shells of food, salamis, potatoes, butter, jam. And this is why I believe that the food was for the German soldiers? The, the food was, was for, for the, the front. Mm -hmm. No, for the, for the for German soldiers, but the German soldiers left it because they had to step back, because the Russians got close. And this is why I believe that uh, it was like, uh, in a way, that God did it. Because, our, and there were hundreds of foxholes in that area. Why did I have to be the one? And outside, and also, when I fall in, I notice that a ladder 
Is that? And they had two, two wooden Door. doors to open, but the doors were, clo were, were covered with grass. Only the part where the leather was it. This is why it was about five feet mm -hmm. in diameter. That's all. And right there, I I felt very happy. I felt, hey, at least I'm not going to starve from hunger. But I also knew because. Even as a kid, you also knew about some medical terms. I also knew that on an empty stomach, you shouldn't eat too much fat. I also knew that to get to it gradually, so I won't get sick with diarrhea and die. So right there, I had enough food. And every morning, actually a few times during the day, I used to climb up the ladder and listen, and always hoping that I would hear Russian sounds, because I knew how to speak here, Ukraine. And I felt as long as I don't hear German, another language, then I'm OK. But little by little, my wound got uh, infected, and it started to swell. And actually, it took the Russians 17 days. They reached that area on the 28th of January. And by that time, actually two or three days prior to that already, I was not capable anymore to climb up the ladder. I was almost like unconscious. I don't even remember soldiers coming down to get me. So you were about 18 years old? Yeah, mm -hmm. but I remember that I became completely conscious. I was laying and then I, because when they, when they brought me up, like I say, the doctor, they couldn't do surgery on me. And so they put me, they laid me down in a wagon and the doctor took out his pocket knife sterilized his knife over a candle and hit me with the knife in the back. And I'll never forget that face as long as I live. This is why I wanted to find him after that. Because before he had a chance to move his head away, his whole face was covered with my bacteria. And right away, I was 100% conscious. Do you remember his name? And I, 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 I told you that the, the name from the doctor was Klein. I don't know the first name. But the, the last name was Klein, and now I can more or less understand why it was Klein because of the German name, which I am getting to mm -hmm. it because his wife was was uh, German. So, and of course, uh, right away, and then he bandaged me up, and then they gave me uh, a piece of paper in Russian that I have a right to stop any military vehicle and to, to take me to the nearest town that has a hospital. And of course, they I went to the hospital and then they performed surgery and I stayed in hospital for two months. And I gained weight. And after that, I made a point to find out about the doctor. And then I found out that the doctor, the reason I, I, I wondered right from the beginning what an old man like that would do in the army. Because he was the doctor, I would say, was in the late 50s. And then I found out that the doctor's wife was German, and she went to, to visit her family in Germany. And she couldn't, and Hitler was already in power too much, and she couldn't get back to Russia, and she was taken to the concentration camp. And the doctor enlisted in the Russian army to find his wife. And when he found out that his wife was gassed, he committed suicide. I found that out later because I went to the Russian command mm -hmm. because I told them that this and this command and that time was here and here and the doctor saved me and this is what. Now the wife was not Jewish, uh, different. Klein. It was a German Klein. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he was not Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so. Now the last two months before the end of the war, where, where were you, from after the hospital, till May? Uh, after the hospital, of course my. My first, my first place was to go home, and because the understanding was, if any of us would survive, to stay home and wait for the, for other family members if they were trying. So, but then the war was not over yet, but that part of the, was already freed. Then I found out that all the survivors, whoever would survive, has to go to Romania to Bucharest and register, because they are started to organize to register the survivors. And any survivor, in order to find out if any of his family would survive, would just go there and they would find out. 
But then by, by doing this, I also knew that the doctor who killed my father was a Romanian. Then, and I found out that he had two brothers. And I knew that if I was gonna publicize myself that I'm looking for him, he would never reply in case he is, he's alive. And actually the same doctor was marching with me in the same time. So I publicized myself that, one, that his brother is looking for him, hoping if he would read in the paper that his brother is looking for him, he would answer and I would kill him. And he didn't, and I stayed there till the end of war, hoping that is from February till, May. till the end of May. And then, of course, by not having any replies, I came home. That was in Bucharest. And that was in Bucharest. And I came home and waited, uh, hoping that some members of my family would join. And then when my brother, at uh, the beginning of June, my brother returned. I his used to name? go out. His name is Sonny, and he lives in Denver now, and he is almost two years older than I am. And he, uh, I used to go out every morning to the railroad station, and every time a, a, a train came in, and hoping that, and, and that's how. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, after that, uh, I was always hoping that they would uh, give up the independence to the Czechs because the Czechs was a democratic country, and by realizing that the Russians would never do that. So I escaped uh, to the border to Romania, and then from Romania to West Germany, and I escaped to the American zone mm -hmm. in West Germany. Now, you were sick right after the war? After I came to West Germany, which it was 40, uh, actually it was the beginning of 46, but around uh, April of 46, I started to feel bad. And of course, I started to lose weight. And I went to the doctor, and he told me that I had TB. And I was in the TB hospital for two years, till 1948. And in the TB hospital, I met a young lady and her, in which she became my wife. And her name was Ruth, a Polish girl. What Jewish. was her maiden name? Uh, Ruth Felsen. And in 48, they transferred us. We were not sick anymore. We didn't have active TB anymore. So he went, he transferred us to a school which it was supported by the, by the ORT, by the, Jew, by the American organization. It was called the UNRWA at that time. And we went to school and they, and I met her, and she was also in the same sanitarium with TB. Mm -hmm. And I knew her even prior to that, uh, I knew her. So you knew her in the sanitarium? In the sanitarium, I you met, met her. her. Right. And she was how old? And she was, she was my age, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, So you, you, you had this friendship but, Right, we had the only friendship, the and then after that, when we went to transfer to school, uh, our friendship became, uh, became uh, stronger. And then in 1949, we decided to get married. Okay. Now, I know this is a hard part for you. Tell, did she tell you right away about her experience? No. Okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, about her? Well, to most of the people, the concentration camp ended after the war ended. In my case, the concentration camp ended four years ago, because that's when I lost my wife. Uh, my wife, and when we got married in 1949, we didn't want to have any children in Germany because we knew that this is not going to be the country we would spend the rest of our lives. So we wanted to be registered to come to America. And we came here in January of 51. In the beginning, you know, you want to get a little established, you want to save a little money to buy furniture and all that. So in about 1952, I, we talked it over, and I says, well, it's time for us to try to raise a family. A year passed, my wife didn't get pregnant. In 1954, I went to a doctor. I said, maybe something's wrong with me. Went to a doctor, and he was a German doctor, and his name was uh, Otto Trott. He was at the... Uh, Clinic, uh, Capitol Hill. He had an office in Capitol Hill. He examined us both. He examined my wife, and he says, your wife could never bear children. 
they must have done something to her in the concentration camp. I asked my wife, do you remember? She says, and she was only 11 years old, because the Polish people were already at the concentration camp in 1941. And, uh, where was she, do you remember where she was in what camp? She told me. But do you I, know the town she was born in? She was born in Poland. The town was Sosnowiec. And she had a uh, younger brother and father, mm -hmm. mother, and an older sister. And uh, then I, I asked her, do you remember? And she said, then she started to remember. She says, I remember that they did something to me, and it was very, very painful, and I was bleeding. But she says, I didn't know. And of course, you know. And after that, what she realized, what the doctor told her, she was never the same. No matter how many times I reinsured her with my love, I told her, hey, this is not the most important thing. She started to get nervous breakdowns. She started to get, uh, uh, how do you call these dreams, which are uh, Nightmare. Uh, nightmares. Nightmares. And also, there were many, uh, she started to wake me up in the middle of the night to pack because so they're going to come and take us away. And there were many, many times that I had to take her to the hospital. In the beginning, it was doctor's hospital, uh, uh, to the mental ward. And, uh, and, uh, and that occurred very, very often, uh, nervous breakdowns and imagination that she was in the concentration camp. And she used to spend weeks until mm -hmm. she got relaxed and she was on heavy medication all the time and uh, and she was never she was never the same and uh, and of course uh, took her to psychiatrists and and nobody in a way could help her and uh, of course and then uh, 12 years ago she got uh, a heart attack first and then uh, 11 years ago she had a stroke and four years ago, she died. Now, do you have, um, of your family, who is left now? I have, uh, only one who is left is my brother in Denver, who is Sonny. Sonny Farkas. Sonny Farkas. And of your wife's family? And my wife's family, nobody. But my wife, we found out that my wife had a cousin in, in uh, Philadelphia, and one cousin in Toronto. Do you know their names? Yeah. and. Uh, uh, and so we went to visit him, and uh, and uh, when my wife was sick, uh, the breakdowns, they were, uh, mm -hmm. well, they were, I told them to try to help her, to try to, because I tried very hard all these years to reassure her with my love. Then she had a stroke, uh, which it was eight years prior to her death. I quit my job. I used to represent different hotels mm -hmm. and I because nobody nothing was as important as her and I just took care of her I did uh, I I had to dress her wash her feed her she was the left side was completely paralyzed she couldn't I was able to revive her leg but she had to wear a brace but she could stand on it but the arm she couldn't move mm -hmm. and I did I went and took a physical therapy course and I did physical therapy with her two three times a day and I was and I stayed with her 24 hours a day and every time her mind was a little clearer I was very happy because there were times that she was aware what happened to her and there were times that she that she didn't even know if it was daylight mm -hmm. and there were times that she didn't even know who I was and I used to ask the doctors how come that could happen. So they explained to me that uh, that dead tissue in her brain, what, what from the stroke, sometimes swells up and, and presses against the good tissue. And when that occurs, she is, I used to call it spaced out. Mm -hmm. Now you remember, can you tell me the names of her cousins, of her relatives that were left? One of them is Aaron. His last name? Uh, Rosen, Rosenberg. 
in Toronto. In, in Philadelphia. Yeah. And Barak Gartner in Toronto. And her last name again? Felsen. Felsen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I wish that I wouldn't have to talk about this Fine. anymore. Fine. Tell me a little bit about 46 to 48 when you felt a certain thing about the people in the uh, in the Russian sector. You mean when I used to smuggle over mm -hmm. people? From, well, there was a lot. Of, there was a lot of people when I when I s smuggled when I went to the American zone. I realized that there was a lot of people which they don't believe in communism, just like I do. And they would be happier if they would uh, live in the West. And I made a point to get to know the border because I succeeded the first time I came over. So I used to, and I went to the Americans. And Which I, border is this? The Russian and the Czech border. Okay. Von Hof on the West side, Ash on the Czech side. And I went to the Americans and I told them, I says, I would like to, what I would like to do. And they said that we, they don't have a budget for that. I says, I'm not asking for anything. And uh, for some reason, after the war, I wanted to help as many people as possible by seeing how many lives were killed in front of me and how many dead bodies I stepped over. And for some reason, right after the war, a human being became very, very worthy to me. This is why I, I told my wife not to feel bad, that I would never abandon her. And I, and I treated her with love and respect, just like if she would be able to bear me 10 children. Even my dream was, when I was younger, if I would get married, I would want to have my own soccer team because I used to play soccer. <laughs> And I wanted to have my own soccer team, but uh, I say, but uh, a human a human being's life is very very dear to me. So I even by not making anything on it, so I used to so I used to go to to churches and in synagogues on the Rus on the Czech side, and they used to line up some people, and most of them, of course, were Jewish people. And at that time, also, they were, the Israel was not legally a state, so they had to smuggle to Marseille, to France. And, mm -hmm. all. and also, the, the, these organizations didn't have enough to support themselves. So I even did business for them, because the, the, the Russian ruble in the West was much cheaper than in the East. And the American $20 gold piece was in the West more expensive. So I used to smuggle over for the kibbutzim, rubles, sell them in, in, the, in, the, in the Czech side, buy $20 gold pieces, smuggle them back over to the West, and that way the kibbutzim could have the expenses to send Jews to. Okay. How, did you yeah. how did you set this up? Give me an example of one way that because you did It wasn't over. just me. It was, it was one, it was one, I had another friend who was, a Pol who was, a, who was born in Poland, and we just started with this. Uh, I his mean, with the, with the ruble, his name was Hershkovich. And uh, the rubles, this was not planned or anything. But when they found out, for example, in Nash, on the, on the, uh, that, so one of the, and my brother, he chose to go to Israel, and he was in one of the kibbutzim that went to Israel. I chose to, to come to the West. My brother chose to go to Israel. So this is how I started. So the kibbutz, what my brother was in, the leader of the kibbutz, and they were trained actually in the West. And it asked me, could you, and he gave me a name in, in that little town, where to go to, and turn it over to another Jew. And that already, that person already had, had $20 gold pieces. It was a, it was a Jew mm -hmm. also. And he gave me a trying to take back the $20 gold pieces. Now how to did the you smuggle side. the people? The smugg I smuggled at the evening, not during the day, and, and, and the, in the woods, higher up, I could see the guards a few hundred feet below, but we went around them. And of course, it got tougher all the time because in a way the Russians found out and they, they increased the guards. And actually, in a way, the Americans themselves stopped me from doing that. 
because it became too dangerous. It became too, and of course, like I say, even so, by doing it, it gave me every one I brought over. It it made me kind of feel good, and uh, and I felt this is the least I can do for society or for the survivors. You remember names of any of the people who, who helped you smuggle these people out? Well, besides this. Well, story. one of them, one of them was was Jack Hemp, and uh, he was my best friend, and, and he died uh, two days after my wife died. Then I buried my wife in Denver. I put my wife to rest in Denver, not in Seattle, because I don't have anybody here. And the only family I have left is my brother and three nieces in Denver. And uh, and I felt, and I bought a plot for for my wife, for me, for my brother, and for my sister. -in -law. And uh, two days after I buried my wife, my friend died uh, from cancer, a bone marrow cancer. So I attended two funerals within two days. But anyway, so, and also there were other, a uh, few people that live in Denver, which they... Which were there non-Jews that helped you in, in Czechoslovakia? It was, it was uh, some, of the, some of the Jewish men that I had contact with, they had non-Jews what lined up. They had more, in other words, when I came, they already had a few people to go over. So they were the ones who set it up. My job was only to, to guide them over the, the border. And, uh, and of course, the, the kibbutzim, where my brother was before he went to Israel, uh, this is where uh, sometimes I smuggled over gold pieces. Mm -hmm and exchanged them there uh, because they had connections from another kibbutzim in Czechoslovakia to exchange it for, for forty dollar gold pieces. Now you have um, how many nieces do you have? I have three nieces. And their names? And the eldest one is Esther and then Helen and Rosie. And they're like your daughters? And we are as close as they would be my daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, very very close and my brother and my sister are very close. And uh, I would do anything for them, and they would do anything for me. I was more fortunate in a way to earn money, uh, but so I helped them. I put them through college mm -hmm. and helped them. And they got married, ran the weddings, and down payments mm -hmm. in their houses. And I'm very, I'm very happy about it. Now, what do you do now uh, that makes an interesting point about your feelings now about this? Now, I would... Uh, I have the best job you can ever get. I volunteer my time for food banks. I deliver food to people which are too sick, too old, don't have any transportations. I deliver food to, to their houses. I use my own car. I don't even ask for the gas back. And every time I bring in a bag of food for a family, it's just, uh, I cannot prescribe how I feel, and uh, and like uh, Jesus would walk into them, uh, they they are very you know they are very grateful, and it makes me very happy, and I count my blessings every day, because I find out that there's a lot of people which are even much worse off than I am, and I do that I do that every day. I call I have three different food banks, and whoever needs me the most that's where I go. And sometimes you even go to the Jewish in the, to the Jewish family service and help out there. And uh, but they didn't call me lately, so I work for the Volunteers of America, the food, you know. The, and this is what I do during the day to fill up my time. I have one more question I'd like to ask you: If there is anything that you would want to leave for your nieces or for my children or future generations about your experience, what would it be? Well, to, to take care of each other, to, to care. Because nothing makes you as secure as caring. I used to, so I used to go to, to churches and, and synagogues on the, Rush, on the Czech side, and they used to line up some people, and most of them, of course, were Jewish people. 
And at that time also, they were, the Israel was not legally a state, so they had to smuggle to Marseille, to France, and, mm -hmm. all. and also the, the, these organizations didn't have enough to support themselves, so I even did business for them, because the, the, the Russian ruble in the West was much cheaper than in the East. And the American $20 gold piece was in the West more expensive. So I used to smuggle over for the kibbutzim, rubles, sell them in, in, the, in, the, in the Czech side, buy $20 gold pieces, smuggle them back over to the West, and that way the kibbutzim could have the expenses to then use to. Okay. How, did you yeah. how did you set this up? Give me an example of one way that you because get it people It wasn't over. just me. It was, it was one. It was one, I had another friend who was a Pol who was a, who was born in Poland, and we just started with this. Uh, I his mean, name? With, the, with the ruble, his name was Hershkovich, and uh, the rubles. This was not planned or anything, but when they found out, for example, in Nash, on the on the, uh, that so one of the and my brothers, he chose to go to Israel, and he was in one of the kibbutzim, but went to Israel. I chose to to come to the West. My brother chose to go to Israel. So this is how I started. So the kibbutz, what my brother was in, the leader of the kibbutz, and they were trained actually in the West. And it asked me, could you, and he gave me a name in, in that little town where to go to, and turned it over to another Jew. And that already, that person already had, had $20 gold pieces. It was a, it was a Jew mm -hmm. also. And, and gave me a turn to take back the $20 gold pieces. How did you smuggle the people? The smug I smuggled in the evening, not during the day. And in and, and the, and the woods, higher up, I could see the guards a few hundred feet below. But we went around them. And of course, it got tougher all the time because, in a way, the Russians found out and they, they increased the guards. And actually, in a way, the Americans themselves stopped me from doing that because it became too dangerous. It became too, and of course, like I say, even so, by doing it, it gave me every one I brought over. It, it made me kind of feel good. And, uh, and I felt this is the least I can do for society mm -hmm. or for the survivors. Do you remember names of any of the people who, who helped you smuggle these people out? Well, Besides this? Well, sure. one, of them, one of them was, was Jack Hemp. And uh, he was my best friend. And, and he died uh, two days after my wife died. When I buried my wife in Denver, I put my wife to rest in Denver, not in Seattle, because I don't have anybody here. And the only family I have left is my brother and three nieces in Denver. And, uh, and I felt, and I bought a plot for, for my wife, for me, for my brother, and for my sister. -in -law. And uh, two days after I buried my wife, my friend died uh, from cancer, he had bone marrow cancer. So I attended two funerals within two days. But anyway, so, and also there were other. Uh, few people that live in Denver, which they... Which Were there non-Jews that helped you in, in Czechoslovakia? It was, it was uh, some, of the, some of the Jewish men that I had contact with, they had non-Jews what lined up. They had more... In other words, when I came, they already had a few people to go over. So they were the ones who set it up. My job was only to, to guide them over the, the border. And, uh, and of course, the, the kibbutzim, where my brother was before he went to Israel, uh, this is where uh, sometimes I smuggled over gold pieces mm -hmm. and exchanged them there uh, because they had connections from another kibbutzim in Czechoslovakia to exchange them for, for $20 mm -hmm. gold pieces. Now you have, um, how many nieces do you have? I have three nieces. And their names? And the eldest one is Esther, and then Helen, and Rosie. And they're like your daughters? And we are as close as they would be my daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very close. And my brother and my sister are very close. And uh, I would do anything for them, and they would do anything for me. I was more fortunate in a way to earn money, uh, but so I helped them. I put them through college mm -hmm. and helped them. And they got married, went to weddings, and down payments mm -hmm. in their houses. 
and I'm very, I'm very happy about it. Now, what do you do now uh, that makes an interesting point about your feelings now, about this? Now, I would, uh, I have the best job you can ever get. I volunteer my time for food banks. I deliver food to people which are too sick, too old, don't have any transportations. I deliver food to, to their houses. I use my own car. I don't even ask for the gas back. And every time I bring in a bag of food for a family, it's just, uh, I cannot prescribe how I feel. And, uh, and like uh, Jesus would walk into them. Uh, they, they are very, you know, they are very grateful. And it makes me very happy and I count my blessings every day because I find out that there's a lot of people which are even much worse off than I am. And I do that, I do that every day. I call, I have three different food banks and whoever needs me the most, that's where I go. And sometimes you even go to the Jewish, to the Jewish family service mm -hmm. and help out there. And, uh, but they didn't call me lately. So I work for the Volunteers of America, the food, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is what I do during the day to fill up my time. I have one more question I'd like to ask you. If there's anything that you would want to leave for your nieces or for my children or future generations about your experience, what would it be? Well, to, to take care of each other, to, to care. Because nothing makes you as secure as caring. You cannot take anything with you, but the caring part you do. Because if you get old and you sit in a wheelchair, instead of thinking, hey, I have so many millions in my bank, you don't take it with you. But if you think that I did something good for society, as being part of society, this, this, would, this you can take with you. I, in a way, sometimes I hate myself, what I am, because I am a, a, I would do anything for anybody, but I don't care too much for myself. But by doing something for somebody else makes me happy. And, uh, and people mean to me everything. Nothing is as important to me. I, I would do anything for anybody. By n if anybody would call me at any time, say I need help, and if I would be capable. And, uh, and I, I wish that, uh, that everybody would have as much caring and love for, for, our race, for the human race as I do. And, uh, okay. and I don't know, uh, I say, I, Thank you. I don't regret, you know, what I, I just hope that I'll be around to, to be available for mm -hmm. some more things to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.